I rarely complain about my work as a pastor, right? Like, you haven't heard me ask for sympathy too much for being a preacher or being a pastor from the front here. I'm going to pause that tradition for the moment here and ask you to feel for me, at least maybe try to appreciate the paradox, the tough, unavoidable situation that I'm facing this morning. It's actually from James chapter 3, verse 1. Let me read that again. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. The paradox is this. For me to simply walk up front and to open the Bible and to teach and preach from James chapter 3 is to invite the strict judgment of God upon myself. There's, I'm, I'm being a little bit humorous by saying feel for me, but humor aside, I feel the weight of that reality. That's a true, that's exactly what James says, is to be a teacher, to be a preacher. And I think there's a lot of teachers in the room right now, is to invite a stricter judgment of God upon ourselves. And I think about that not just when I'm preaching on James chapter 3, but I think about that Every time I walk up front on a Sunday morning or stand up front to teach from the Scriptures with any group, it humbles me. The question uh, I have for us here this morning is this warning just for teachers and preachers, those who are up front teaching other people, or is there a broader application for every single one of us in the room uh, who follows Christ? This is what we'll talk about as we look at this passage together this morning. If you haven't turned to James chapter 3, I invite you to do that. While you're turning, I'll mention this is actually going to be a two-part sermon in this passage because, frankly, I really have come to appreciate that one of the main themes in the book of James that he just keeps coming back to, and we'll talk about this, is our words, our mouths what we do with our tongues. In fact, back at the end of chapter 1, James gives us three different tests that we can put ourselves through to see if our religion is pure, meaning our faith and our worship of God is actually real. And one of the tests that James gives us is look at the words that you say, the way you use your mouth. This is James 1.26. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Right out of that, into chapter 2, James actually gives us an example that I think is intended to help every single one of us realize we do blow it when it comes to our words at times. That's the passage you'll remember on uh, partiality. It's a church setting. And James talks about, okay, it's a, it's a full church, a wealthy person comes in, and the greeters or the pastor will go up, and they'll use their words. They'll say, oh, so glad you're here. Let's find you the best seat in the room, outside of the spit zone. And let's get you a cup of coffee. And, but then a relatively poor person comes in, and we'll use our words, and we'll say, you know, you can go sit in the very front row. Or you can sit anywhere. I don't care where you sit. You can sit at my feet. And the idea is there, who of us can't relate to the idea that we've shown partiality to various people through our words and and through the way we talk to people? Now, in our passage, James is going to hit this subject of our, our words, our mouths, directly between the eyes. And he does this starting with teachers starting with preachers, those that will stand up front and teach the Word of God. Why teachers? Why does he start there? I think one of the answers to that is in verse 2. James says, For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. Now the point there is not that, hey, there's maybe some of you that are perfect 
people that completely at all times bridle your tongue. James' point is, who does this? Meaning nobody does this. Nobody perfectly bridles their tongue. Nobody is a perfect person. To answer the question then, does this have broad application for all of us? It absolutely does. Like James' point is that we all sin at times with the words that we say. So this is not just a passage for teachers or for pastors or preachers. We all stumble with our words. But here's why I believe James starts with teachers, why he targets teachers. And I think this idea is fairly simple. More words means more errors. More words mean more errors. And who uses more words than teachers, right, or preachers? People who stand up front, like I'm doing right now, and use one word after another, after another, after another, while you sit and are not speaking. I'm piling up words up here. It's not unlike other things in life, like if you think about baseball. The more it bats, the more strikeouts you're going to have, right? Or the more times you get behind a vehicle and go out for a drive, the more accidents you're going to have, the more breakdowns you're going to encounter. Parents, right? The more children you have, the more broken hearts and broken bones that you're going to have to deal with. And the idea is is true with words. Like, the more we use words, the more we are going to mess up. The more we're going to make mistakes, the more we're going to actually sin against people, possibly really hurt people. This is why, by the way, I write a manuscript for every sermon, and I'm happy to let you look at this. About 90 90 to 95% of what you hear me say is in this manuscript, and I write it out because one of my great fears is that I would get to the front up here and go off script for quite a while and say things that aren't true or possibly say something really clumsy or something that might be hurtful. And so I write a manuscript uh, and script it out and I talk through it before I walk up front to try to do my best, but I still make mistakes. In fact, I've made several mistakes. I made one mistake this past summer. We were in the Proverbs series, remember? And we were in that, it was the sermon that we were talking about life and zeal. And I said, I kind of anchored for a while in one passage, and I said that the, the word that our English version translates as life is actually the word shalom in Hebrew. Now, we looked at several Proverbs that morning, and that was true about a different proverb, but I chose the wrong verse, and I ran with it for a while accidentally. And I was so grateful at the end of the morning, a gentleman in our church came up to me and said, hey, I've kind of been looking at this and studying it, and, and I, I don't think it's actually that same word. And so we went back to my office, and we looked at it in the Hebrew online, and I'm like, you are right. And I said, if you don't mind, I'm going to wait until we get to James 3 because to come out with that mistake because it's a perfect illustration of, you know, the mistakes that we make when we teach and when we preach. And, and I'm okay admitting that. I'm not even embarrassed to admit, admit this because hopefully you've heard this from me enough. I really mean it. This is perfect. Every letter, every word of our Holy Scriptures is breathed by God and infallible. And this is perfect. I am not. And and so one of the things I love about this church is, and this is why we always say turn with me to this passage, is I want people bringing their Bibles. I want them following along. I want them checking my statements. I really do. And I want you to feel the freedom to, if you see me make a mistake or or maybe need to clarify to make sure I didn't make a mistake, come up and talk to me. It's not embarrassing for me. I'd rather get up and say, you know what, hey, I misspoke that week than somehow leave you with an impression I don't make mistakes. I do. But this is, this is one of the things that comes with, 
with teaching. I just I did some numbers, and I always need a calculator to do numbers because I'm not good with math, but I've preached approximately 40 times a year since starting in 2005 as your pastor. 40 times a year for 19 years, that's 760 sermons. Most of those mornings have been two services, so technically it's about 1,500 sermons. I can tell you that my average sermon is in a manuscript with the word count, it's 2,300 words. There's a big difference, I, I think, in time if, if I'm pushing 2,400 words. You're probably looking at 45 to 50 minutes. Today, it's about 2,250, and so it's going to be a little shorter than normal. I look at word count all throughout the week. And so 2,300 on average, that means that in 19 years, I've spoken around... 3.5 million words right here. 3.5 million words that I've said and talked and spoken while you have been relatively, most of you, silent. That's a lot of words. 3.5 million words that I will be examined by before the Lord one day. And, and not just examined, I will be judged with greater strictness. That humbles me. In all honesty, it probably doesn't humble me as much as it should, and that would be a great prayer for me. But it does humble me, and it sobers me uh, every Sunday morning. I've never preached here that I haven't started physically on my knees, not metaphorically, physically on my knees back in my office. It's a, it's a humbling idea that teachers use that many words. There's another reason I think that James cautions people from teaching and preaching. It comes out in this passage, and that is those who teach and preach, I think especially if it's over a longer duration, are oftentimes tempted, uniquely tempted, to feel prideful. They're tempted with this idea of pride, with ego. Think about it with the nature of teach, teaching, right? Teachers and preachers, they're used to people wanting to listen to them. Right? They're used to people asking for their opinions on important subjects and important issues. They're used to having captive audience. And the... That's a, that's a test on one hand. We're talking about tests and trials. That is a good gift from God, to, to be given the gift from God, to uh, be able to understand things and to have a group want you to teach. That is, a, that is a gift from God that presents a test, but the temptation that we bring to it, that I've brought to it, is the temptation to make much of me. There's that temptation toward pride. I've watched several older teachers and preachers, in my opinion, grow into a place of pride where they're far too quick to give their opinions on subjects, or they're far too quick to throw other people or teachers or Christians under the bus, far too quick to make fun of people and have their audience go along with them and laugh. One commentator on this verse writes this about public speaking, that it provides temptations to virtually every form of evil speech, arrogance and domination over students, anger and pettiness at contradiction or inattention, slander and meanness toward absent opponents, flattery of students for the sake of vainglory. James mentions this pride, or he mentions this boasting. We'll jump down for a moment here in verse 5, at the very beginning of verse 5. He says, So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. And we skip down here because that's, that's in the middle of this passage 
verses 3 through 6, but it's verse 5 that's the interpretive verse, meaning it's verse 5 that tells us why James uses the three word pictures that he does, we're going to look at. And his point here in verse 5 is that our, our tongue, our, our, our words, our, our tongue is incredibly small, like compared to the rest of our body. It's incredibly small, but it's used to make ourselves seem incredibly great. Uh, like our tongue is, is so small compared to the rest of our body, but our tongue is the epicenter of our character, of our heart, of the direction that we are being formed. Our tongue is the center of that. Our tongue is so small, but it can direct us further and further off course if we're not appropriately warned about it. Now again, that's the interpretive verse. In 3 through 6, James gives us three different metaphors or word pictures to make this point. The first one is in verse 3, and it has to do with bits in the mouths of horses. Horses, Look at that one with me. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. So, I am not a horse guy. Horses sense fear in me correctly. So I had to look this one up. But the, the typical adult horse, and I know this varies, there's, there are horse people here that are going to be like, that's not entirely true. And I know you're right, okay? But online, Google says that a typical adult, adult horse is about 1,000 pounds. And I looked up the weight of a bit, and these bits, they'll vary a little bit too, but they're about one pound. So the idea here, and this is James's idea, right, is something one one thousandth of the size of the horse, you put it in the horse's mouth, and it will control where the horse goes. It determines if that thing stops or goes forward, left or right. So that's the first image. The second image James uses is a rudder on a ship. Look at uh, four in the beginning of five. Look at the ships also, though they are large, so large, and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. This may be a surprise to some of you, but I'm also not a ship guy. I had to look this up as well. But for a typical sailboat, the rudder is about one one hundredth the size of the sail. And that's not the, even the entire boat, but maybe double that. But the idea here, again, is, is the rudder is so small relative to the whole thing, but yet the rudder decides the course of the ship, like where it goes. And that's the point. The third image is at the end of verse 5 and, verse, and then into verse 6. This is what James writes. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. In uh, 2007... A young boy was playing with a box of matches and with a match started a fire in California that burned 38,000 acres and destroyed 21 homes. It's amazing what you can find on Google. Again, I'm not claiming this to be truth. I am claiming this is what Google said is true. Um, One adult tree, like one full-sized tree, can yield approximately 383,000 Matchsticks. So one tree can make 383,000 matchsticks. And uh, so one 383rd of a tree burned approximately 7.5 million trees, if you assume 200 acres or 200 trees per acre. Now, again, whatever those numbers mean, that's one fire 
the point James is making is, is consistent and it's, it's clear, and that is the tongue is a small part of our body. It is. On the average person, a tongue weighs about a fifth of a pound. And so let's say you have a, you know, slightly unfit, maybe slightly fit preacher who's maybe about 200 pounds. That person, uh, the tongue would be 0.001% of his body weight, his body weight. That's an incredibly small amount relative to the whole thing. But James's point is that our tongues, even though being so small, really are the epicenter that directs our formation, directs how we live our lives. They really do shape and form our character. And the, the warning here is they can do that in a way that we become sick with pride and people who sin more and more against the Lord and against one another. That's verse 5 again. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. One of the things, and I didn't realize this till studying it here together these last several weeks, but one of the things that James is doing in his letter is he's helping us appreciate that some of the things that we, we would say, ah, those aren't big deals. Right? Some of the sins that we would commit that we would be like, you know, they're not the big sins. Right? They're not a big deal. James is, is giving us an opportunity to see these are massively offensive things to God. They're massively hurtful things to, to other people. One of the things we already talked about is partiality. And we use our tongues for that. But the example of you have a Sunday morning and somebody walks in and you see that they're upper class, right? And you're thinking about the kind of people you like to hang with. And so you go over and you show favoritism for that person while you kind of are dismissive or ignore somebody relatively poor. And we do that kind of stuff without even knowing we're doing it. And then if it's pointed out, we're like, oh, well, at least it's not adultery, right? At least it's not stealing or murder. And the whole point is that that's a massive offense to God. For Christians to show partiality, that's a big, big deal. Here he's saying, so is how we use our tongue. This, this was convicting to me this week to think carefully about but I really do think we are, we are very dismissive of our sins that we commit with this tiny organ. The sins that we carry out with our mouths. I think we cut ourselves a lot of slack. I really do. I think I'm in that group with you. I think we gossip, right? We, we pass along tasty little morsels of bad news about people and we'll even package it up nicely and say, oh, this, I have a prayer request. You know, I'm sharing this with you so that we can both be in prayer for this person. Or I think we use something that is true and maybe a little bit hurtful or embarrassing about another person, and we kind of add a little humor to that, and we get everybody laughing, and then we say, oh, I'm just teasing. Or I am, I'm sarcastic. I grew up in a sarcastic home. I don't mean anything by that. I think we, we make little indirect comments intended to pressure other people to do what we want them to do without having to actually ask them directly to do what we want them to do. Like passive-aggressive speech. It's rampant. <laughs> and I don't even think we know we're doing it. I, I think for a lot of people, it's just the way you, they grew up. They, just, they learned it from their parents. We learned it from their parents. We learned it from their parents. Let's not actually tell the truth Let's, let's use a whole bunch of words to get the outcome we want without having to tell the truth. And I don't even think we know we're doing it. I think if we knew we were doing it, we would still be like, well, at least it's not a big sin. These are big sins. How we use our words, how we use our tongue are, are big deals. These are, these are important issues to God. Why is this? Why is it such a big deal? 
I want to, this is partly why we're taking two weeks on this. I really want us to think deeply about this. The reason it's a big deal to God, and it's a big deal to each other, how we use our tongues, is that our words do things, right? Our words have the power to perform things. They, they, they bring things about. We talked about that in the summer when we looked at Proverbs 18, 21. It's the point of this verse. Death and life are in the power of of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruits. So the whole, you know, the whole adage of sticks and stones will break my bones, but words can never hurt me could not be more false. Our words have the power to bring life to other people or to bring death to other people. It's our words. It's our tongue. And here's, here's why, to drill down into the nuts and bolts on this. When you use a word to describe something, so it could be a person, place, a situation, when you use a particular word to describe something, you control the listener's perspective on what you're talking about. And if you can influence and control the listener's perspective on what you are talking about, then you have exercised great power in the listener's attitude toward that thing, how they'll respond to it, what they'll do toward that thing. There's a sense in which naming things, the words we use to name things, describe things, in a very real sense, brings that about. Advertisers know this. If, they, if an advertiser doesn't get this, he or she's only going to be in the industry for like a week. Like, advertisers get this. I went to the store the other day to buy some body soap. And I'm looking at all the, the names, right? And I reached for, I ended up buying zest because who doesn't need zest, right? Like, I wake up tired most mornings and I want to walk in the shower and, and I, want to, I want to, whether it works or not, I want to, I want to, Use something that at least holds out the idea of, I'm going to add a little zest to your, I'm going to wake you up. The company, and I looked this up too, according to Google, zest is owned by High Ridge Brands. And if they'd have named that product sluggish, right, or lifeless, or you'll get clean, but you're going to feel tired all morning, that'd be a big title, I wouldn't have bought it, Right? But they get it. They know that we'll call it zest, and we can influence then how Zeke's going to feel about this product as it sits on our shelves. They can influence how I think and feel about that product. They're going to influence my actions toward that product, and I bought it. Another example, you know, sometimes I'll buy, you know, shoes, workout shirt, and a lot of times I'll buy Nike. Well, Nike's, it's from the Greek name for the winged goddess of victory. Victory, right? Nike, victory. If the company would have named their company Blabby, which is the Greek word for failure, I'm not buying it. I'm Adidas all the way. And so marketing, like advertisers, they know this. They know the power of a word. And if they can get us to think or perceive something they want us to think or perceive, that will actually shape our actions and control our behavior. And we know this. Think about the abortion issue. Think about uh, the womb. What's, what's in the womb? What's growing in the womb? Well, we would know from the scriptures, like the, the true language to use is, you can say a number of things. It's a pre-born child or it's a person but those that, those that don't see that, and they don't want that, they want, they want the other side of the opinion on that, what are the words that they would use? I've heard everything from a mass of cells. Right? I've, heard, I've heard, I literally heard here recently, the product of con conception. See how impersonal that is? You think that's not unintentional? It's absolutely intentional because they know how you name something controls 
perspective about that thing. And if you can control perspective about that thing, you control, can control how people will act and what they will do. That is the performative power of words. Back to the question of why this matters so much to God. Why, why James is, is being so clear that this should matter so much to you and I. Gets back to the very first commandment. Right? The, the two parts to the great commandment, right? That we are to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. The whole point here is one of the ways that we either love our neighbors or one of the ways that we, we sin against and hurt and tear down our neighbors has to do with the performative power of our words, whether they're present or not. It's an issue of, of love. And you're going to see later in this chapter next week, you'll see it's also an issue of worship, of our actual worship to God. We can use our words in ways that deeply wound and change the tra- trajectory. I shouldn't use big words up front. The trajectory of a person's life. Words have the power to do that. In the book, The Joy Luck Club, Amy Tan tells a story about a little girl who, she was a prodigy. Like, she was just amazing at chess. I don't even, I still, I don't think I know how to play chess. I don't think I could identify all the parts. But this girl at like eight, at eight, she became a national champion at chess. She had that ability where she could see like the next 10 moves and, and, and what those 10 moves would need to be depending on what the other person would do. And she could see it 10 moves out and then carry it out and she could win. Like she just had this, this amazing gift. The problem for her was that her mother became very envious of that gift, very jealous of it and the glory that her daughter was getting. And the only consolation for the mom was that she thought, well, this could make money for me. And so the mom was very aggressive. She was very pushy. She really goaded her daughter on. You need to enter more, win more. And this is a little girl, right? This is an eight-year-old little girl. And at one point, she breaks down. And I think in the book, it says the first time in her life, she actually talked back to her mom. And I think she just, it was a bad moment. She, but her mom replied to that by leaving the room and then for weeks ignored her, was silent. And then one day, the mom walks into the girl's room very calmly, very coolly, and she says to the girl, you are nothing, nothing at all. And she turned and walked out. And so Amy Tan is quoting this girl when she grew up, what she says about that moment. And she writes, I I quote, what she said to me was like a curse. This power I had with chess, this belief in what I had been given, I could actually feel it draining away. All the secrets and strategies I once saw so clearly, I couldn't see anymore. All I could see were my mistakes, my weaknesses, and the best parts of me disappeared. One moment. What is that? One, two, three, six words. And it, it changed a girl's life. That's the performative power of words. Now, that power can be used for good. I'll lighten things up and give you a you know, somewhat upbeat example. I enjoy cooking. I really do. I, I like getting home from the office and opening the fridge or opening the pantry and just being like, oh, I can, yeah, I could create this, you know. And I just really enjoy doing that. And when I trace that back, I think it goes back into my childhood, like when I was seven or eight. Because I just remember my mom, and I think my mom was really good at the performative power of words. But I remember my mom saying, Zeke, come help me with dinner. You are so natural in the kitchen. I remember her saying that. Or I I also remember, and this is clear as a bell, she's like, chop these two onions for me. Nobody chops onions like you do. I chop onions all day for her. Now, was I a natural in the kitchen? 
Like, was I truly at eight years old especially gifted at chopping onions? I don't think so. But my mom's words, my mom's words did something to me. They helped me believe in something I could become. And, and I, I really would go all the way back to that moment and say, that's a big, that was, that's kind of why I love being in the kitchen. Well, I think about this all the time as a parent. When our kids were in that new phase of kids out of the house, right? But when our kids were in the house and they were involved in sports, athletics, we would go sit and we'd sit in the bleachers and I would think all, all throughout the game, I would think about what words will I say to them when they come up to us in the bleachers after the game. And sometimes they were bad games. You know, sometimes our kids, you know, didn't play well. And, and I would go to things like, I think the, probably the most common thing I said to our kids was, I love being your dad. Like with everyone else on the court, that I get to be your dad, I think about that the entire time I'm up here. Or I would say to him at times, you know what I most respected about tonight? It was your, your work ethic. If they didn't start, I would say I, I saw it in warm-ups. I saw it, how you helped clean up after the game. Now, <laughs> were my kids always on their A game work ethic-wise? Well, am I the best onion cutter in the world at eight? No, not necessarily, but, but that's the performative power of words is we can look at what we want our kids to see and believe about themselves and we can speak those, those vision, that vision to them and we can watch them by God's grace grow into that. That's the positive performative power of words. What we say to others builds them up or tears them down. It either lives out the greatest commandment or it sins against the greatest commandment. This is interesting. I, didn't, I don't think I thought about this till this last week either, but how we listen to the words of other people holds the power to sin or love. The Bible makes an interesting statement here that listening to gossip Listening to slander, listening to somebody else sin with their tongues is a moral sin for the listener. Let me give you one verse on this, Proverbs 17, 4. An evildoer listens to wicked lips, and a liar gives ear to a mischievous tongue. This is how important words are, right? Listening to gossip. Listening to slander, listening to critical statements about somebody else is still sin. <laughs> like, think about that. We are responsible to God for how we respond to those who are sinning with their mouths. I, th I, think, that, I, th I think that this category probably exists. There are probably people out there that they don't want to be seen as a gossip, right? as one of those kinds of people, but they actually kind of like hearing the news. They like hearing the latest. They don't, they're, they're entertained by gossip, and, but, they, but they're careful to, to just listen and then not necessarily contribute. Or, but I do think these people become known for, by the gossipers, this is somebody that kind of completes me, right? This is somebody I can go to, I can talk, I can gossip. They're not going to hold me account for it. They're not going to call me out on it and stop it short. They have their way of enjoying it. And I think these people probably find each other. But the Bible says about the person listening there that that person's an evildoer. That person's a liar. And again, I mention that because it all gets back to this is how important words are. Like it's not just our responsibility with the words we choose to speak, it's our responsibility to love God and love our neighbor with the words we choose to entertain. That's how important they are. Like I said, this is a two-part sermon, which if you're like me, that sounds fun. I get to come back and get my toes stepped on next week too. 
My toes are sore this morning. For this week, let me just leave us with maybe two challenges or two pieces of, of a, two homework assignments, and I think that they fit together, and I think if we do this together, I think we'll be prepared for next week. The first is, let's slow down and examine how we use our tongues this week. And maybe just, you know, for you to see alone, I'm not going to share my notes on this, but maybe to journal and kind of assess our day every day. How did I use my words and my tongue to love my neighbor, to build other people up, to give vision toward Christ? And then how did I use my words and how did I use my tongue to to hurt people or to sin against people? And, And perhaps journal about that. If you're listening to the Spirit, your toes will get sore. Because this is one of James' main points. We're going to come back to this. James' main point is we all stumble in what we say. There is only one who is perfect, and that is Christ our Savior. And and that gets to the second part of this challenge, is maybe, maybe choose one gospel, maybe like Matthew or Luke, and as you're journaling and and paying attention to the words you say, may we read the red print in that gospel, meaning read the words that Jesus said. One of the things that fascinates me, and, and I just keep kind of having categories open up to me the more I study the scriptures, is that in, in the ways that we sin, Jesus was always perfect. And in this category of, you know, Jesus was a teacher. He used a lot of words. Like he stood up front. He was a rabbi and he, he, he preached. And yet every single word Jesus said was holy. Not one word did he say, oops, that was clumsy or oops, that was a mistake. And, and so I think reading the words of Christ in one gospel will, will open up our eyes to what perfect speech looks like, which will then also, I think, help us assess ourselves. But, but part of what I want us to think about as we do that is that as you read the, the flawless, perfect, holy words of Jesus, to keep coming back to the gospel. Because there's no way around this. And this is, this is James. We're going to see this. James is giving us what holiness and righteousness looks like with our mouths, right? But he's also coming right back and saying, but you're not doing it. And I'm not doing it. But then we get to chapter 4, and it's all about grace. And the reality is, as you read the perfect, righteous words of Jesus to keep coming back to the reality that, that his righteousness through his words, that that's now been credited to us. So that when we stand before God, our Father, he doesn't actually have a shaming posture toward us because, man, Zeke's used 3.5 million words before his congregation and, and I can tell you how many were wrong or prideful. or No, he looks at me and he sees the words of Jesus, and he says, that is Zeke, that's my son, that's Zeke. And that's given to us as a gift. That's given to us by grace. So our identity before God isn't all the mistakes we'll journal about. Our identity before God is the righteousness of the red words printed in our Bibles that Jesus spoke that now make up who we are which gives us the freedom to be honest and to be sober and to be truthful in our sins, knowing that we have the forgiveness of Jesus. We have the righteousness of Jesus. We're not actually going to be judged and punished based on our words. We're going to be judged and rewarded based on the words of Jesus. And let's work on that this week. Let's think on these things. And we'll come back and finish the passage next week. Let me pray for us. Father, this is our prayer, that by your Spirit, you would help us to think soberly and truly about the way we use our mouths. 
and the words that we speak, the words we entertain. And we also pray just by your Spirit that you would help us to see the perfection of Jesus, our Savior, in specifically the ways he spoke. And that you would remind us of the grace given to us through the gospel, that the righteousness of Jesus is actually given to us as a gift. His words now are our identity. So we just, we ask that you would walk with us and teach us this week. Pray in Jesus' name, amen.